Hey, you're listening to the Wake Up to Freedom podcast. Today is episode number 18, and I have Jonathan Kraft with us. He's an awesome entrepreneur. He's living the life that probably many people out there want. So you have a lot of value to get from this episode. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Wake Up to Freedom podcast, the show where every week your host, Daniel Carbonell, will share with you the best tools and strategies that will help you finally say goodbye to your job and start living your life with freedom and purpose. Now, welcome your host, Daniel Carbonell. All right, yes, this is Daniel with the Wake Up to Freedom podcast. Thank you so much for being there. Today's episode number 18, which is awesome. But before we go to the interview with Jonathan Kraft, which I totally recommend. I will suggest that you can check us out in the in our new YouTube channel and you can go to youtube.com forward slash Daniel Carbonell and find the episodes right there as well. Now, I'm always happy to help. So if you have any questions or you want to be featured in the podcast, you want to talk to me, um, please reach out. Don't worry. I'm going to be taking, I want to be uh, answering everything in email. So just go to helpdesk at wakeuptofreedom.org. That is helpdesk at wakeuptofreedom.org. Now, in the last episode, I didn't have a guest with me, but I was a guest on the Freedom Loving Podcast show with Kevin Koskela, which is an awesome guy. I cannot recommend him enough. You have to go and check him out. So again, if you want to look at that episode, you can go to wakeuptofreedom.org forward slash episode 017. Now, today I have an awesome interview again with Jonathan Kraft, and um, I just want to share that interview with you. He's awesome. He and his wife have been doing this for a while. So let's go to the interview, and I hope you enjoy it, okay? All right. I am here with Jonathan Kraft, the owner and operator of striveforimpact.com and carryandjonathan.com. Jonathan is an SEO coach, website optimizer, entrepreneur, writer, photographer, husband, uncle, and world traveler. He has been what you can call a serial online entrepreneur for a long time. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. A long time is kind of, uh, it is a long time now. It's kind of sad. Little, it's kind of like bit. an understatement, awesome. actually, you know? It's, it's kind of crazy how, how the journey goes, for sure. Yeah. Unbelievable. So in that note, Jonathan, uh, why, why don't you please take a few minutes and, and tell us a little bit more about you and, and share a little bit of your story, if you could. Sure. Yeah. So back in back in 1999, uh, I was working at a college. I was a general manager for a radio station, and um, we actually started building websites for the clubs on campus. So I built one for the German club, um, which I was part of, and then I built one for the radio station, and I started learning just really basic HTML. In those days, we had to actually code pages by hand. So in, you'd open a notepad document, and you would just type you know, carrot, HTML, carrot, and then carrot, head, carrot, and really geeky stuff. Uh, so I would build web pages that way. There was no WordPress. There was no multiple type. Content management was a dream, not really a reality. There were things for it, but it wasn't great. So I started with that. Um, and I started, so I went abroad as an exchange student in 2000, uh, 2000, actually, 2000, 2001, and went to Germany. And I knew how to make cheap phone calls to Germany. And at the time, a cheap phone call to Germany was nine cents a minute. And so I put up this webpage, how to make a cheap phone call to Germany from America. And it was on a service called GeoCities that was run by Yahoo. Anyway, the page got so much traffic because in those days, we could put up a website and get lots of traffic to it right away um, that Yahoo actually shut down the page because I was getting too much traffic. And so I opened up another GeoCities page and it was all free. Uh, but I put up more pages, how to make a cheap phone, cheap phone call to America, from, or f to France from America, how to make a cheap phone call to, and I did one for every country in the world. And it was a whole year later before I realized, you know what, I could actually make some money doing this because there's people who sell these calling cards online and they have these things called affiliate programs. And so I partnered with a couple of different phone card companies that would deliver uh, calling instructions, basically, you'd buy a pin online for 20 bucks or 50 bucks or 100 bucks, however much you wanted to buy your calling card for. And uh, the, I would make a small commission from referring people to those companies. So somebody would come to my page, how to make a cheap phone call to Germany. I would say, hey, you know, here's this cheap way to call Germany. 
And by the way, here's two or three calling card companies that you may want to select. Here's the reasons you want to select them. Here's the reasons you don't. And they would go to those websites and purchase calling cards from those companies, and I would make a referral question. And uh, at the time, I had come back from being an exchange student, and I was a teacher. And I also started doing some network marketing, and I was just trying everything. Um, so I was building a network marketing company or a network marketing team within a company and did that for nine years. I did affiliate marketing for like full-time affiliate marketing while I was a, a full-time teacher as well. And um, so, yeah, lots of different avenues. I mean, I could talk about all that stuff, but <laughs> did network marketing for about, about nine years, uh, full-time affiliate marketing after I quit teaching in 2003 for about... Uh, eight years until Google rewrote a lot of rules between 2009 and 2011, and things changed quite a bit. Um, and yeah, my wife and I got to spend two years traveling the world from 2009 through 2011, and we were in more than 35 countries in those two years. So pretty amazing, you know, that's 15 or I guess 12 years worth of stuff summed up in about three minutes. Wow. And now you're settled in, uh, in Colorado, I think, right? In Denver? Correct. Yep, grew up here. We actually bought a condo at the end of 2012 in downtown Denver and quickly became, I mean, Denver's just grown by leaps and bounds. And so we decided to start renting out our condo and we bought a house in the mountains and we're renovating the house in the mountains. Wow, very nice. I heard like, I've seen in, in your website a, a lot of stories about you, you being in the Kilimanjaro. You just mentioned to me, you know, before the call, of course, you being in Lima. So you've been in like many, many countries um, around the world, huh? Somewhere around 45 at this point. Wow, wow. <laughs> Do you still consider yourself like a travel, uh, uh, let's say a travel or, an, or a digital nomad still? I would say so because even though even though we're not actively traveling all the time and always on the road, we are always going traveling. So, um, you know, it's nice to be able to go somewhere for a weekend, but it's also nice to be able to go somewhere for a week or two or three and be able to say, okay, we're going to leave things at home and we're going to go travel somewhere for two or three weeks instead of, you know, when you have a job, um, you can go for a weekend, generally speaking, or you might get a few days off to be able to go somewhere for a few days, but being able to go for a couple of weeks and have that time freedom to be able to make that decision or not is really nice. Very nice, Jonathan. Now, you also mentioned that you were doing affiliate marketing mainly, right? You did a little bit of a network marketing as well, but uh, mainly probably right now uh, affiliate marketing. Now, why did you choose affiliate marketing as the main way to earn money online since you know you have drop shipping you can do you can sell physical products and etc why affiliate marketing so actually not doing so much with affiliate marketing now i more now have consulting clients that i work with to help them build their businesses and i still earn commissions from things i did from affiliate marketing but i'm not actively building affiliate uh, companies now and i mean so we can, we can go down that path why that decision was made. Um, but Google made a lot of changes between 2009 and 2011. And I very quickly realized between network marketing and affiliate marketing that if my name wasn't on the building, I didn't have control. And that's great because to get started online, it's a great way to get started to figure out you know, how to make some sales, how to build up some web pages that actually get some traffic and sell other people's products where you don't have any sort of buy into the product. You don't have to purchase anything to drop ship it. You don't have to. There's no um, real commitment to affiliate marketing. So you don't have to commit to a big outlay of expense in order to get started. And I think that's one of the great benefits of affiliate marketing. I think one of the downsides is, again, you don't have control. So if you're sending your traffic off to somebody else's website, what happens when that traffic gets to somebody else's website is up to the person that owns that website, not up to you. And so, but I do think for people getting started online, affiliate marketing is a great way to go. All right. So definitely you, rec you um, will suggest affiliate marketing for new entrepreneurs. Absolutely. I think it's a great way to get. So one of the projects that I did years back uh, was called Three Money Methods. And there's only three ways to make money online. 
That's it. Everything falls under one of three categories. And I think people get started online and they get very confused about, well, should I do this thing? Should I do that thing? Bright, shiny object syndrome. I think anybody actually starting business has a little bit of ADD. You just have a nature, natural tendency towards just like the bright, shiny object syndrome. Ooh, I'll go do this and I'll go do that and I'll go do that thing. Um, but there's only three real ways to make money online. And those three ways are to sell your own products, to sell someone else's products, or to sell advertising space. And I think you can combine all three of those in almost any business model. But if you sort of categorize things as a person getting started into, am I selling my own products? Am I selling someone else's products? Or am I selling advertising space? Then you can kind of decide what direction to go in using that model of what am I doing here? So like drop shipping, for example, would be an example of selling your own products, especially if you're private labeling them under your own brand and having somebody drop ship those products for you. It is kind of selling your own products, even though somebody else controls the delivery of those products, you're actually selling a product on your own website that ideally, you know, if you're private labeling that product, then it's your product. Where affiliate marketing would be selling someone else's products. Um, and, you know, you're basically saying, okay, well, I have this site that's about this and I'm going to sell someone else's products within the context of that website, but I'm going to send them off to the other page to buy that product. And then advertising space, the, the very best example of advertising space is YouTube where we all go to YouTube pretty much on a daily basis, or most people on the internet anyway, end up on YouTube at least one time a day. And the one time, at least once a day. <laughs> and they, uh, you usually will see an ad either before or during the video that you're watching, or you'll see an ad on the right-hand side or something. We all get annoyed by those ads, but those ads add up to billions of dollars in revenue for Google. And the reason is because they've built something that attracts people in on a regular basis. So if you can build something that attracts eyeballs on a regular basis, then you can probably sell some advertising space within the context of whatever that is. So you mean like uh, creating something, probably creating some type of a content and start giving it away? That's what you mean? Correct. Yeah. So, you know, if I set up a website, Instructables is a great example of this. Instructables is a website where you can go and learn how to do anything. And they actually take user generated content and people put up their own Instructables. But what Instructables does is runs ads alongside of those things. They get lots of traffic to that website because people want to know how to build a pump for their basement or they want to know how to put up a wall or anything like that. And so people come to that website. And then Instructables, because it gets traffic to that website, it sells the advertising space around the content on that site. Very nice, Jonathan. Now, you mentioned um, that many new entrepreneurs, uh, they have a little bit of an ADD syndrome. Um, I can totally relate with that, of course. You know, once you started to learn certain things and you start going to the next shiny object and kind of like derail you from your progress and you start, you know, you kind of like, lose your focus and start moving to the next thing, to the next thing, um, especially because advertisers do a hell of a job in, do, in helping you to do that, right? <laughs> to distract yeah. you. Um, so what, um, what mistakes besides, besides that one do you see in, in new entrepreneurs? Uh, not only distracting from, you know, not only get distracted by the new shiny object, uh, what other type of mistakes do you, see, do you see young entrepreneurs that we should be avoiding? Just a quick note on the bright, shiny object syndrome. I always think of, I heard a guy one time give a training and he was talking about, and this leads into it, but he talked about most people are like an octopus on roller skates in a wind tunnel. <laughs> right? And if you, I have this, this image of an octopus on roller skates in a wind tunnel just trying to catch its balance. And I feel like, and I'm totally guilty of this too, where we go, oh, there's this thing over here, I'll go over here. And they're just blown about by the wind. And I think one of the biggest things that people don't take time to do that is really important to do, and, and I find myself victim to this all the time, is not taking time to get your mind right at the start of the day, at the start of the week, at the start of the month. Um, because uh, so I, I listened a lot to a training or several trainings from, and you can get them all on YouTube now, they're all free. I used to pay for them, but they're now on YouTube for free. But a guy named Jim Rohn, R-O-H-N. 
Yeah, uh, and if you've been in network marketing at all, you'll you'll come across Jim Rohn, not Jim Rohn, the sportscaster, but Jim Rohn, the business guy. Yeah, it's a Tony Robbins uh, mentor, right? Yes, exactly. And one of the things that he talks about in his trainings is where we end up in life. So everybody gets like a little ship, right? And we're all sailing our own little ship. It's like a sail ship, sailboat. And we all are in the same ocean. We're all going somewhere. We've all decided we want to go to a certain place. Or if you haven't, you probably should decide where you want to end up or what you would like to see a year or five years in the future. And some people end up at their destination and some people don't. But the thing is, we're all on the same ocean. We're all getting the same breezes of life. You know, we're all getting, sometimes people get caught in hurricanes, and I've certainly been caught in hurricanes of life, uh, very difficult circumstances with family or friends, or uh, some people go through health challenges. You know, those are all the winds of life that happen. And what happens for people when they arrive at their destination, the difference between the people who arrive at the destination they want to end up at and the people who don't is how they actually choose to set their sail. And choosing to set your sail is not a one-time event. It's a daily, sometimes hourly type of activity. You know, if you're trying to forgive somebody and you're caught up in a mental dialogue of, uh, you know, I, this person did this thing to me and it's awful and I can't believe how this happened. Those things are going to happen. I mean, I can't tell you the number of companies I've partnered with on an affiliate basis that probably haven't paid me the commissions that I was due. And that happens. It's just life. Things happen. Things break. Um, you know, systems have a hard time working. People will hack your website. Things are going to happen. Uh, it's not going to be an easy journey. And anybody who tells you it is, is, oh, you know, you can make money in your shorts overnight. Yeah, that's great. It's all nice and well and good. And you, I hope you find a path that makes it easy for you along the way, but, or makes it simple. But it's not easy. Um, and so the, the difference between where people end up and where people, you know, people who end up at the destination they wanted to end up at and the people who don't is how they set their sail on a daily basis. And I think that comes from mindset more than anything else, which is listening to really good information from really good business, motivational, informational kinds of things that help get the, the good info into you as opposed to you know, an hour or two of watching some program that's not really benefiting your mind very much. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with that 100%. Um, now, Jonathan, you were mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, you were mentioned a uh, get your mindset right, right? And um, for sure, you, you just also mentioned Jim Rohn and videos in YouTube. What else do you do to get your mindset right? Um, I, I seen uh, earlier, I've seen a story that you went to an affiliate summit a um, couple of times at least or something. And uh, so, so that means you go to seminars, you, go, you read books, you listen to audios. What, what do you do to, to get your mindset right? Yeah, I mean, anytime I find that I'm having a hard time getting my mindset right or feeling really grumpy or feeling really angry about something or frustrated. Uh, I do have kind of go-to things that I go to. So, um, you know, if you find some music that you really like, uh, music can be a huge motivator just listening to really good music. For me, that ends up being really peaceful music, really calming music. And I just try and find somewhere and take a few deep breaths and calm down and relax. And uh, for people, some people that's meditation. For me, it's I, I never really thought of sitting and listening to peaceful music as meditation, but for me, I guess that is a form of meditation. Um, a couple of podcasts that I'm really into right now, I like. Um, so um, take a couple steps back. My first sort of mindset book was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Wow, Obviously, yeah. you know, huge one. Um, there's some very sexist language in there because of when it was written, but it's still a very good book. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was re really good for me to kind of get out of or just just kind of realize there was another way of thinking or another way of being. Um, so and I think uh, I mean, I'll talk about uh, business side of things, but I think it's also very important to kind of grow your own mental, spiritual uh, side of things, too. But anyway, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant. Think and Grow Rich, those were all very foundational to me in getting started. Um, I recently found the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, which Stoicism is kind of the general category that that all falls under. Um, but uh, that, that's a really good sort of, it was written 2,000 years ago by Marcus Aurelius at the time when the Roman Empire was crumbling. 
and to all of these things going on around him and and just trying to lay out some rules for ways of being and ways of dealing with difficult situations in life. I also, right now, I really like the Tim Ferriss podcast, uh, Four Hour Work Week. I read that when it first came out in 2007, I want to say, kind of dating myself here, but read Four Hour Work Week. And it was kind of like, because I'd already been building business up to that point, and I already had built some things that would allow us to go travel, although we didn't have the income yet. Um, and, and we can talk about the travel too, because I think there's some interesting points in there. But um, we, I read that book, um, Four Hour Work Week, and I was like, oh, I now have permission to go do the things I wanted to do. I don't know why I needed permission from Tim Ferriss, who has never met me and whom I've never met. I hope to meet him someday. But I, I just was like, oh, this is cool. I can actually go do this. Some, for some reason, I needed that permission. And so we started modeling our lives around a way to be able to go and do that. And um, for our work week was hugely instrumental for that. So I really like listening to the Tim Ferriss podcast. As far as like growing my mind and knowledge about what's going on, I really like Radiolab. Radiolab has some amazing programs. I, I mean, I just learned, I was just listening to one about the US-Mexico border and it just gave me a whole different perspective on all of the the mainstream media stuff going on about that. Or there was one I listened to about the Second Amendment. I mean, totally not business related, but it's really important in business to have something more to talk about than just business and content to create that's around something not just, hey, you know, you can make money online. That's great. That's nice. You know, but let's be people too. Let's let's deal with the real stuff of life that and and get some real information as opposed to the 30 second sound bites we get in the media. So yeah, definitely. That, that was a I, I, sorry, really, sorry. Really long, really long answer. But uh, anyway, that's that's the topic <laughs> of mine, apparently. So awesome, yeah. awesome. Um, and you know, I I like the fact that you say, yeah, let's be people. You know, let's be uh, congruent and let's be. Um, I'm probably, I don't know, honesty, honest, maybe right. Um, now, Jonathan, you when we were talking about mindset and everything, uh, and especially on your entrepreneurial journey. Um, did you have this mindset mindset before? Like, let's say when you were in school and college, or, or did you have this type of mindset? Like, you did you were were you reading and, and looking to seminars and, and other uh, mentors and stuff like that? Really good question. So I was raised with uh, with some good information around me. Um, my dad was self employed. So if you think about the ESBI thing, and it's interesting how much of our philosophy and attitudes is shaped by what we were raised with, and I, I think I was raised with some really good philosophies, and I think I was raised with some philosophies that I really had to change for myself. Um, so I think, you know, I, I remember being raised with the philosophy of money doesn't grow on trees. And I had to sort of recorrect that for myself and change it to money doesn't grow on trees unless you plant money trees. Right? What's a money tree? Well, a money tree is anything that grows based on the things that you give it to more than what you gave it to begin with. Right, so I put an apple seed in the ground and it becomes a tree and I care for it. I nurture it. I give it good soil. I give it water. It grows. And then I protect it from the deer and the things that are going to come and try and take it down. And I protect it over time and it becomes a bigger tree. And maybe about five years in, I get a few apples and I can eat those apples. Right. But maybe 10 years in, I get a harvest of apples and I can turn those into applesauce and jams and jellies and I can sell those. Right. And what if I plant a forest of apple trees? or an orchard, I guess, not a forest, forest, but an orchard of apple trees, and I can sell all of that. Now, that's going to take some labor and some work to actually care for those things over time. And I think that's the part that sometimes gets missed is people are like, oh, I'm going to make a million dollars overnight. No, you're not. <laughs> you're just not. Uh, but as far as being raised with certain philosophies, you know, money doesn't grow on trees unless you plant money trees, I think rewriting a lot of these phrases um, is really important. You know, one thing I was raised with, uh, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. It's worth, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right the first time that I can hear my dad saying that. And it's a great philosophy because it means plan what you're doing before you do it. The challenge of that philosophy is how can you ever do something right the first time you do it? You don't know. You've never done it. How can you? You can watch a, a whole bunch of videos. You can read a whole bunch of books. You can go through the whole thing. But until you actually do the thing, you don't know if you did it right or well. And so I think 
that in those philosophies, there's some really good teaching. And I think by adapting and molding them to your reality and your circumstances and the the mindset that's going to serve you best, I think is the best thing. I wasn't really raised with a lot of personal development books. Um, I don't know exactly how I started getting into that. I think network marketing was a big one for me, just learning about all these books and, and starting to read um, a lot of personal development. And to be honest, I have a really hard time finishing books. I have probably 40 books <laughs> at my house that I haven't finished that are personal development. But I got through three-fourths of them, and I got the information that I felt like I needed from the book, so I just didn't finish it. Um, speaking of bright, shiny object and, and uh, you know, going off to another thing. But uh, I don't think I was raised with it per se, but I was raised to go after information and, and to learn knowledge that would benefit me in, in having a really good life. And I think that that, uh, that does carry over. I do think you have to find that knowledge and information. But the nice thing about the world we live in today is it's so easy to go find it. The sad thing about or difficult thing about the world we live in today is that it's so easy to get sidetracked in the process of trying to find it. So, Yes, you're right. Um, and I relate with you um, definitely because I grew up the same way. You know, like I didn't really have... Uh, um, Let's say I never was taught that I could like change my entire life just if I start reading books and learning some new stuff. So, but I, I joined a network marketing company and actually they give you certain trainings and they give you a couple of books for you to, to read. And, and that's how I started. And, and, you know, really, I have a lot of books right behind me as well. And I don't finish them just like you, <laughs> but I love them. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I, I, uh, I totally relate with that. Um, now you were mentioning, okay, let's say books change your uh, the way you see things. Of course, you get perspectives from other people, right? Uh, the, the their life experiences or or people who let's say biographies or people that are inspiring, and, and that kind of like change your mindset and everything. Now you also mentioned travel, and I want to get back to that because um, how how much do you think that travel in the world has changed your mindset and how big of a part is uh, traveling to other countries and seeing all these different cultures uh, changed the mindset of an entrepreneur? It's huge. I think um, it, it, and not just the mindset of an entrepreneur, but the mindset of the world really. So going and studying abroad in Germany, it was really interesting and and the problems become even worse, you know, where if you look at Fox News and CNN side by side telling the same story, you get an entirely different story. And nobody, the mainstream news is not going for objective truth in most cases anymore. Um, they're just, they're telling a biased perspective and you know, people are like, oh, that's fake news. No, it's just a biased perspective. And I think the challenge is when people think their biased perspective is the right perspective, uh, it really creates a situation where you and I don't have common ground to meet, right? If you think something totally one side and I think something totally one side and I am certain that I am right and I'm unwilling to entertain the idea that part of what you're saying could be right. I think that is what more than anything else has led to some of the biggest wars in our history, some of the biggest conflicts in our, in our history as a species is the unwillingness to entertain that there is another way to look at something. Um, and there's always another way to look at something. There's always uh, someone asking the right question at the right time. You and I talked just before we started this recording where you, know, you said someone asked you a really important question. What's your plan B? And the right question phrased at the right time can can change everything. And I, I feel like the problem a lot of times is that people aren't asking the question, you know, is that true? Or is that how I would like it to be? You know, that might be how it is right now, but is that how I would like it to be? And I think travel actually leads to asking a lot of those kinds of questions. So for example, uh, when I was an exchange student in Germany, um, it, it was pre 9-11. So September 11th hadn't happened yet. And um, the day that the towers went down, I was back in the U.S. I had been back in the U.S. for about six months. And the day the towers went down and all of, all of the things happened on September 11th, I actually went to German news to read the German news about September 11th because 
I found the American reporting of it to be so Americentric that it was hard to get a real perspective on things. Um, one of the things that's often forgotten about September 11th is that of the 19 people who supposedly died on September 11th, 13 of them were alive after the fact because their identities had been stolen. Most people don't know that. Um, but I mean, these people, there were literally people somewhere in the Middle East driving taxis, right? There, there's one story about a guy who was driving a taxi and his friends started calling him going, dude, you were reported on CNN is dead. You know, he's somewhere, I don't remember exactly what, I, I mean, I can send you news articles or whatever, but it's, it's really interesting because that side of the story or that part of the story or that part of the reality wasn't even told in the U.S. You just don't even see that part of the story. And not that, you know, not that there's some big conspiracy theory or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about all that. But what I'm saying is there's a totally different way of approaching the same thing. Um, a good example of that, I speak German. So the word in Germ German, Gemütlichkeit. Gemütlichkeit cannot be described with one English word. And you know this from Spanish. There are certain concepts in Spanish that are explained with one word or a couple of words that can't be explained without using a whole bunch of words. So gemütlichkeit in German is like the cozy feeling of sitting at home by a fire with a book in your hands, snow's lightly falling outside, there's a fire in the fireplace, and maybe you have a cup of hot cocoa with some marshmallows in it. That's gemüt, <laughs> right? That's gemütlichkeit. We don't have it in English. We have cozy. Yes. But you can't really explain gemütlichkeit. Yeah. So it's it's the same way of explaining something, but just in, in one thing. Um, you know, we have the word convenient in English. There's no way to say convenient in German. You can't say it without using like three or four words, like favorable, practical, on time, or timely. Um, but you, you, you just can't say convenient in German because it doesn't exist. So I think they've recently adopted convenient as a word that you can use in German now. But, uh, but when I was there, you couldn't say convenient. Nobody knew what convenient was. So um, they know what it is, but they, they can't describe it using one word. Anyway, it frames your, your frame of reference when you have a different way of looking at the same thing or approaching it from another side, whether you're trying to deal with a business problem or trying to deal with a relationship problem, the wider variety of language and experience that you have, the easier I think it becomes to approach that from another their perspective and to try and resolve it um, or, or reach an amicable solution much easier. So I, and whether that's business or global or societal, um, I think travel has a huge role to play in making the world a better place. Wow. That's uh, amazing. I, um, you know, I tell you a story, a story really quick. I actually, I work for, for, uh, for a cruise line when I was younger, I worked for Disney cruise line. And now when I came to Orlando to have this, uh, training before i jump into the cruise line there were like maybe around 20 people in the room and everybody was from different countries right and uh, the person who was making uh, the training he kind of like put a like scenario you know and like a little scenario with three different characters and then we had to choose which one was the good one which one was the bad one and which one you know like something like that and everybody had different perspectives because of the cultures and different, you know, the backgrounds. So I, I was like, I can't believe it. these people think different than, than me, you know? And I was looking around. I was so confused. Everybody has different perspectives because, of course, you know, the cultures and, and, and that actually helped me to see views in, in different ways, for sure. Just like you're mentioning, um, it, there are always two sides of the story, right? Well, and, and more than that, I mean, um, so as you travel, uh, buses are going to be late, trains are going to be late, um, you're not going to get your luggage on time, uh, things that are going to be completely out of your control to do anything about. And so in addition to having different approaches to looking at things, um, you also learn through that to be flexible and to be adaptable. And those skills that come from travel, I mean, the, the three most important things when going traveling are adaptability, adaptability, and adaptability. <laughs> uh, because you, you just, you have to adapt to the existing situation, whatever comes up, because you're just not going to know. Um, really good example of this. So uh, for the first four months of our traveling in 2009, uh, almost every day, you know, we'd be somewhere in Central, Central America in most cases. Um, a, I just, you know, the structures and systems are just so different in Central America from 
North America. And so I would find myself asking this question every day. Well, why don't they just, you know, an example, we were in uh, Quito, Ecuador, uh, actually outside of Quito. Anyway, they'd piled this huge pile of rocks in the street, in the middle of the street that they were going to be using for landscaping and road base. But they put it right in the middle of the road. They just dumped it there. I was like, why didn't they just put it on the side of the road? And after four months of me asking this, why don't they just question every day? Carrie, my wife, looks over at me and goes, because they don't. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, because they don't. That makes sense. And for whatever reason, it just hit me in the moment, like, stop asking the stupid question. Why don't they just, they just don't because they don't. And I'm not going to be here long enough. I'm not willing to invest the time in learning enough about why this is the way it is to even have the right to ask that question. Why don't they just? So in, two years later, we were in Italy and we, my parents had come to visit and um, they didn't have ceiling fans in the places we were staying. None of the places in Italy have ceiling fans. And my dad, literally the same question. I was like, oh, this is where I got it from. Uh, he said, well, I just don't understand. I mean, why don't they just install some ceiling fans? This would make this place so much cooler. And I was like, because they don't. You know, this is two years later. And about six weeks later, so we actually spent six weeks in Italy. And about six weeks later, I was having a conversation with a friend and um, they actually had a fan running somewhere and she shut it off. And I was like, why'd you shut that off? That's really kind of, uh, you know, it was cooling the air. And she said, oh, because, you know, we're going to bed. And um, Italians believe that if you have a cold or cool breeze blowing across you as you're sleeping, that you will wake up with muscle pain in the morning. That's no, a, like I, I a fundamental... We... I think in Peru, we feel the same. <laughs> okay. I had no idea. I mean, I've just I'd never heard of that, right? Yeah. They do it for a reason. There's a reason that that thing is happening that way, but I'm not, it's, it's a problem with me. It's not a problem with them, but looking at the world as though it's a problem with them, as opposed to saying, well, why is it that way? Uh, or just accepting that's how it is. And then, and then learning about it, because when you come from a place of acceptance, you can learn about it. And this very much applies to business. Um, okay, this is how it is. Okay, so now what can we do about it? As opposed to, well, it shouldn't be that way. Okay. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> you don't get anywhere when you start with, it shouldn't be that way. You yes. just, you can't go, there's nowhere to go. If you go, okay, this is how it is. Okay, I accept that. And now what? What does that mean? Um, or, you know, how else could we work within the constructs of what the, what it is, as opposed to saying it shouldn't be that way. Well, it is that way. So now let's work with that. Um, and I, th I think that skill has been hugely beneficial in all areas of life. Um, it's, it's hard though. Sometimes, man, you, you come across people, you're just like, oh my gosh, seriously. <laughs> you come across a situation that's like, this should not be this way. And the more you live in that moment, uh, the worse that problem gets. As opposed to just accepting, okay, that's how it is. That's how they are. But that doesn't have to determine how I'm going to be. So you definitely believe that traveling the world or, or traveling abroad uh, uh, has changed your mindset, has made you maybe uh, understand more other people or cultures. And, um, but um, would you recommend to maybe a new entrepreneur that is looking to go out there and travel the world and do this online thing? Do you encourage people to do that for sure? There's a phrase in the 4-Hour Workweek where he says something about earning in pounds and spending in rupees. Wow, yes. and, and that to me was just like, oh man, how can I earn in British pounds? Because at the time, when I read that, the British pound was 2.3 pounds to the dollar. It was unbelievable. We were in London and getting our butts kicked by the exchange rate. Uh, And so, yes, absolutely, because there, so while we went traveling, when, when we left to travel, people often ask us, how much money did you save up to go travel for two years? We get that question a lot. And we say, none. We, we were in debt $22,000 when we left wow. on our travels. Wow. We paid off $22,000 worth of credit card debt while we were traveling. And people are like, how'd you do that? Well, we, uh, we lived places where it was less expensive to live, where the quality of life was still equally as good, or we found ways to have a good quality of life while spending a lot less. And that's easier outside of the U.S. Uh, in a whole lot of places, not everywhere, but in a whole lot of places, that's much easier than living in the U.S. Wow. And that ties to my next question, actually, because I was uh, talking to Kevin Koskela, he has, a, he has a podcast called Freedom Loving. And um, we were talking and I kind of like thought, 
the idea of, you know what, like probably get ready, you know, get your things in order and then, you know, you get prepared and then you just go out there, travel the world. But he was more of the idea, you know what, do it now, man. Just just burn the boats and just go for it. You know? <laughs> uh, now, what do you think about that? Like since you, since you went traveling with over $20,000 in debt, uh, what, what do you think about that? I think it really depends on the person. I would, if I was in that situation, like, should I just burn the boats and go? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't ask my friends, family, and neighbors. I wouldn't yeah. ask the people closest to me. I would ask somebody else. I would find someone who I could, you know, either hire who had done it before, but ask someone, you, you know, either hire them or, you know, ask for their time, buy them a cup of coffee or whatever. But I would ask someone who's already done it and get some advice from someone who's already done it, as opposed to asking people around you who may or may not know. I think it's going to depend on the individual situation. Um, so I, I would not give blanket advice to anybody to say, burn the boats and go. Even though you can recover, even if the very worst happens, you know, I mean, the, the very worst that can happen is you can die. Um, uh, you know, right. One step above that is, <laughs> you know, you get attacked and robbed and everything gets taken from you and you have nothing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's everybody's fear about going and traveling. And I, I think while that does happen, um, it can happen anywhere. It can happen, you know, in your own home. Um, but 99.999% of people in the world are good people doing the best they can. Um, and so, you know, heaven forbid you meet one of the seven to 10 mean, nasty people in the world who moves around a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's Jim Rohn training. But, um, you know, I, I would just say, ask someone who, who's been there, done that. Uh, try and get some good advice from somebody who's already been through what it is that you want to do and and see if they can offer you some advice that's helpful for your specific situation. I, no. I love the idea of burning the boats and going, but each person is going to have their own considerations to take into consideration um, uh, when when they're going to do that. So plus, you, I think you got to know yourself as well. You know, if you're gonna if you're willing to stick to it and really persevere and go for it, you know. But if you're gonna quit right away in the next in the first month. Probably, or you, you know, you quit before in many projects that you have. Probably, you're not uh, there yet, right? Well, and what skills do you have, and yeah. have you built up some form of income, um, and is that important to you or not? You know, I, because you can, you can figure out how to make money somewhere, anywhere in the world, really. Um, yeah. You know, you can go be a bartender or wash tables, or there's always a way to go be of service for someone and earn some income based on that. Um, you know, it may not be as much as you want to earn. It may not be what you want to do, um, but there's always a way to do that. Uh, the question is just your, yeah, again, your tolerance, your experience, um, and your willingness to deal with things. Um, it, us going traveling for two years, that was not our first time going traveling. You know, we'd, we'd already been to Africa and climbed Kilimanjaro in 2006. I'd been an exchange student in 2001. Um, I got to go to Italy in 1993. Uh, I'd been to Paris in 2000, or sorry, 1998. Um, so I'd done a lot of traveling before we left on our travels for two years and had some experience with acclimating and adapting and um, all of that. So, so sure. difficult to say. I would, I would say it depends on the person, um, but I would say ask for some advice from not from, not from friends, family, neighbors. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ask, ask for advice. Go find someone who's been there and done that and ask for advice. Yeah, it's like, um, I don't know who says that thing. I don't know if it was Jim Brown. I don't remember. But, but I heard that if you want advice on basketball, don't ask somebody who never played basketball, you know? Right. <laughs> so uh, now, Jonathan, really quick, because I, I, we're out of time. But um, if you have to do it all over again, if you, or let's say if you, to, if you could go back in time, would you do this all over again? There are parts of what I know now yeah. that I didn't know then uh, that I wish I had done sooner. Okay. So controlling more of the product that I sell. Um, so now, I mean, uh, what I, what I uh, help people with now is website testing. I help people get websites set up. Um, I improve their presence on the internet, lots of things like that. That's basically the product that I offer, um, which is more of a service. And, you know, we keep people's websites secure and up to date. And I have um, a lot of clients that we do that for now. And I have a team. Um, <laughs> getting a virtual assistant, I would have done that much sooner. 
so I have a virtual assistant that works in the Philippines and she's awesome. Um, and she's full time. So, which is amazing. You can hire somebody to do similar quality of work for a lot less money in other parts of the world. So I would, I would do that sooner. Um, I would also set up more control because I mean, from 2000 through 2011, 2012, basically, I had no products, no products, no services of my own. I was selling everybody else's stuff or I was selling advertising space. Um, and some things changed between 2009 and 2012 that, that made that a much more difficult way to earn income. And I'd learned all these skills that I could then apply to having products and services to offer people. But I would get started with my own product service offerings much sooner. But for the first year or two getting started online, sell other people's products, find out how to get traffic, um, you know, do it as a part-time deal. You know, Jim Rohn always says, uh, when I was making double what I made at my job uh, in my part-time business, then I went full-time with my business. And, mm-hmm. and I think that that, and, and had done that consistently for a few months. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, we haven't even gotten into talking about real estate, but that's one area that we've really um, focused on in the last five years. And, and so now we rent out property that we own and, um, and earn cash flow that way. So anyway, um, I would get into having my own products sooner. But spending a year or two selling other people's products and services and selling advertising space is a great way to get your feet wet and learn, for sure. All right. Awesome. So let's say selling some advertising space, then do some affiliate marketing, then create your own products and real estate. Since you are, I guess the real estate comes after, you know, Robert Kiyosaki. And, and of course, this is the most, uh, the smarter way to, to build uh, assets, right? It's, I mean, it's a great way to build an asset, especially if you find a market that hasn't yet taken off. Yeah. Um, but being self-employed, banks have a hard time calling you, qualifying you for loans if you're self-employed. So that's a whole other topic yeah. we can talk about another time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, anyway, I, w- I would say out of all of this, you know, the, the best thing people can be doing who are listening to this is doing what they're doing right now, getting knowledge and information. Um, spending time with people who have been through or experienced what it is that they're about to experience and letting those people shortcut your learning curve um, so that you can get there quicker. Awesome. And one of the nicest compliments I got just very recently, I'd totally forgotten and given some a guy some knowledge years and years ago. He now buys and sells websites. That's his whole business is buying and selling websites. And he found me on Skype and he's like, hey, man, I just want to thank you so much. Here's the website I built. Here's the thing I did. I didn't remember talking to him. Wow. But apparently I spent an hour and a half with him in 2009. And he was like, you shortcutted my experience. And man, you just told me all the pitfalls and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I honestly don't remember this conversation or this guy like, at all. <laughs> I had no memory of him. And it was just so cool to have given that to somebody else. Um, so, uh, you know, anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. Jonathan, so, thank you anyway. so much, man. I, I, uh, I, I can see we're out of time, so think, I don't want to take your time so much, but thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Uh, would you please share any final thoughts and if your contact information so our listeners can learn more about you? Yeah, so I think one of the big things um, to make sure that you have, they did the study, I think Yale years ago, they did the study um, over 50 years of the success that people had. They started with them when they were 20 years old and they started, they went all the way to 70 and they tracked a ton of things about their life um, and the, the, over this 50 year study. And there was a huge gap in certain groups of people. So they had these two groups that some ended up with huge amounts of wealth and some ended up with small amounts of wealth. And they tracked not only financial wealth, but also spiritual wealth, uh, social wealth, you know, because there's lots of different kinds of wealth and how happy these people were. So they tracked all these different things. And the biggest uh, factor that the people in the more successful, and I use successful with quotes, but the more successful group had was written goals. So they'd actually taken time and they'd, they'd had a practice to sit and write their goals. And so I would recommend if you're just getting started, write down some goals, even if they seem huge, even if they seem unaccomplishable. Most people underestimate what they can accomplish in 10 years and they overestimate what they can accomplish in a year. Um, but 
so just writing down some goals and actually making those things reality on paper um, is huge. So anyway, uh, if people want to get in touch with me, you can send me an email. I'm going to give you my personal email on this podcast. Um, so my email is strive, S-T-R-I-V-E, the number four impact, strive for impact at gmail.com. So you can send me an email. If you send me an email and say, I want your free goal setting book, I have a free goal setting book um, that you can take and use and run with it. Um, is actually something I got years ago from someone else who I've sort of, I got permission from him to rebrand it and, and add some things to it. So I now give that to people to set their own goals for their own life. So if you send me an email, strive for impact at gmail.com and say, I want your free goal setting book. I will send you my free goal setting book and um, no obligation. There's nothing to buy in it, anything like that. Uh, just me being helpful. And if you want to find me on Twitter, I don't really use Twitter, but I, I'm Strive for Impact online. So S-T-R-I-V-E, the number four, Impact. If you find that online, chances are good it's me or somebody impersonating me. So Awesome. Awesome, Jonathan. Thank you for being on the show today and for sharing your experiences with our listeners. Your story is really inspiring. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Danielle, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Have a good one, man. Take care. You Bye. too. Bye. Awesome. I really hope you enjoyed the interview with Jonathan. I think it was uh, one of the best ones so far. I really enjoy one of my favorites. Um, now, of course, if you want to check us out in our new YouTube channel, go to youtube.com forward slash Daniel Carbonell. Otherwise, if you're listening to us in Spreaker or iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, please don't forget to subscribe. Of course, give us a nice uh, review. And I hope you are enjoying I'm looking forward to see you in the next episode. So stay tuned. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Wake Up to Freedom podcast with Daniel Carbonell. To download special bonus content, access to the show notes and more, make sure to visit wakeuptofreedom.org. That's wakeuptofreedom.org.